I think it's 2004, 2004 they, they take him because the baby born January 2005. They sent him, they deported him 2008, the 8th of December. Because he, he, I think they said he had lawyer was, you know, fighting the case for him, but I don't know really what happened. I think he, they tricked him and just sent him home. Windrush, or you know, what's called now the Windrush scandal, those issues around immigration status and deportations have been around for quite a long time, so they're not a new phenomenon. Um, but what we've seen unfold is this mass deportation, wholesale deportation of people. So you're talking about entire planes chartered just to deport people en masse to Commonwealth countries or former Commonwealth countries, but we're talking about um, deporting people from the African and Asian diasporas. 25,000 Caribbeans served in the First World War and Second World War alongside British troops. When my parents and their generation arrived in this country under the Nationality Act of 1948, they arrived here as British <coughs> citizens. It is inhumane and cruel for so many of that Windrush generation to have suffered so long in this condition and for the Secretary of State only to have made a statement today. And we're here because we were wronged for things that we did not do. Now is the time. Many of us here worked. We worked. We put our hard, you know, blood and sweat into this country with our national insurance contributions. 20 years down the line we're being told, I oh, know you've got, excuse my French everyone, you've got Sorry, please don't, because I'm upset now, right? I don't mean to swear, but this is the way that I feel right now. I come in, I listen to everybody, so nice, so good. But yet, there's still people here, there's people suffering. I get four to five phone calls a day from people that's older than me. I'm 58, 58 next month. And I get people who are 65, 64 saying to me, I don't know if I've got a room for me to live in. I was working, I ain't got no money. It's a shame. The Home Office has been telling me that this is not my home. I don't have ties here. I don't have enough family ties here. They've said that I can go back to Jamaica and I can maintain communication by social media or a telephone with my dad. They even suggested that my dad can move back to Jamaica, bearing in mind that I've got a British brother that was born here. We went over together to Jamaica for a two week um, holiday to settle some business. Was never allowed back and my father became very ill. He became blind in the end um, and subsequently died in Jamaica in 2010. Can she explain how many have been deported? She suggested earlier that she would ask the High Commissioners. It is her department that has deported them. She should know the number. Can she tell the House how many have been detained as prisoners in their own country? Can she tell the House how many have been denied health under the National Health Service? How many have denied pensions? How many have lost their job? Do you agree that the net migration target has distorted the decision making and led us to a lot of these problems? No, I don't. I don't think that's got anything to do with it. Have you asked the Prime Minister to get rid of the net migration target? I have not discussed that with the Prime Minister. You've not discussed this? Migration target I think, I think I'm not going to be drawn any further than private conversations I might have with the Prime Minister. You said when you were initially asked by the, the Chair um, that you had not discussed the net migration target with the Prime Minister and then you said you're not going to be drawn on private conversations. Yeah. Which answer? In the, in the context of what we're here to discuss, which is the whole Windrush saga, the whole Windrush um, sadness really, I have not discussed the net migration target with the Prime Minister. Can she apologise properly? Can she explain how quickly this team will act to ensure that the thousands of British men and women denied their rights in this country under her watch in the Home Office are satisfied? I bitterly, deeply regret that I didn't see it as more than individual cases that had gone wrong that needed addressing. I didn't see it as a systemic issue until very recently. My story um, starts from coming here as a baby and 
1962. Um, I think I travelled over on a ship, or oh, it's got to be a ship, it's big, with my mum and my um, aunt to come to meet my father, who had travelled ahead of us um, to start a life for our family. When the Impa Windrush passenger ship docked at Tilbury from Jamaica on the 22nd of June 1948, it marked the start of the post-war immigration boom, which was to change British society. This is the place for me. He came because there was um, my three other siblings, my older siblings and myself. Um, so he came to sort of like pave the way. At that time, they were saying, oh, come to the motherland. We've got jobs for you. So daddy was like, OK, um, I'll come over. My dad was a tailor. Uh, so when he came over, obviously we had family over here already. Um, I think my mum's aunt was over here. My mum's sister was over here, which is my aunt. She was over. And um, they sort of like paved the way. So come, we've got a room, you can stay. And then from there you build yourself up. So that's basically what daddy did. I came and um, when I came to England, um, I just, my parents came on a British blue passport because then it was a blue passport. But my passport, even though it said I was British, had a Jamaican thing because Jamaica had just become independent the August and I came the September, so it was just that cut-off point. My uncle came here when he was 10 years old to cold England, having been sent for by his parents. So he didn't have a choice about coming to this country. His parents had settled here, they'd come to the Caribbean, part of the Windrush generation. I was born in Jamaica and then I migrated to the UK in 2002 at age 12. I initially came to see my dad and then my dad and my mum decided as a unit to, for me to remain with my father. Arrivals at Tilbury. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-servicemen who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sailed for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Prodded by public opinion, the colonial office gives them a more cordial reception than was at first envisaged. Many are to be found jobs. Our reporter asks them what they want to do. Uh, why have you come to England? To seek a job. And what sort of job do you want? Any type, so long as I get a good pay. Some will go into industry, others intend to rejoin the services. Now, you're an ex-Air Force, aren't you? Yes. Are you going back into the Air Force again? Yes. Did you know if you'll be accepted? I think so. Some plan to return to Jamaica when conditions improve. I'd like to ask you, please, are you a single man? I am a single man. My, only my mother that is depending on me. And I'm also an ex-service man. You're an ex-service, RAF, yeah, are you? RAF. I took a course in Scotland in case making. And uh, I'm desirous of going back there to see if I can further because I like it very much. And uh, I'm trying to help myself and also help my mom. By the time we had landed, um, he had acquired a room for us to stay in. Um, I can remember it was a, a Jewish man. He was really short, short and cute. <laughs> really short man. Um, and we had a room in the basement which had access to a back garden because I remember mummy picking the um, blackberries to make jam and boiling them. Um, and from there, we, he said to mummy, I've got a bigger room uh, where you can go. So we had moved to that bigger room, which mummy and daddy then split into bedrooms, two bedrooms at the back, and they had the curtain in the middle. And then they had, um, they made their little front room. Between 1948 and 1970, Nearly half a million people moved from the Caribbean to Britain, which in 1948 faced severe labour shortages in the wake of the Second World War. Men and women were recruited and invited to come rebuild the economy, especially in the reconstruction programme, in maintenance and repair work and in the construction sector. They were also needed to run public transport and to staff the new NHS. It was this prospect of employment that attracted many of the Windrush passengers to leave the Caribbean. They came to a country that, despite changes and improving living conditions, was marked by structural inequalities and discrimination. Experiences of daily racism were a common thing for Asian and black people in the 1950s onward 
especially from the Teddy Boys, the Skinheads and the National Front. From the 1960s, relations between the police and many black people, especially youth, deteriorated. It was felt by some black British people that they were unfairly picked out and harassed, that racist murders were not properly investigated and that police were directly responsible for some death in police custody but were not called to account. As soon as after the Windrush docked at Tilbury in June 1948, immediate and successive governments have always tended to try and limit migration. Um, successive governments as well, both Labour and Conservative. In some cases you have the Labour government start the, um, um, the, the legislative process and then the Conservatives would ratify it and vice versa. So there's always been a hostile um, reception to particularly people of colour. As we know, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Um, we know of the love die neighbor syndromes of the 1970s, mixed blessings, mind your language. Discrimination was rife. In 15 or 20 years time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Well, I can already hear the chorus of execration. <coughs> How dare I say such a horrible thing? How dare I stir up trouble and inflame feelings by repeating such a conversation? My answer is that I do not have the right not to do so. I remember mummy and daddy having to go through a lot of racism. You could hear daddy come in and he would say, oh, you know, I had to end up arguing with someone because they didn't even moan, say, don't argue with them. But there was a time where we had a, a teddy boy and a teddy girl living next door to us. And yeah, and I remember my mum and dad getting in an argument and all I could hear was a lot of swearing and crash, bang, wallop. So I've gone downstairs and I've tried to poke my head through and all I could see was milk bottles being thrown across from my mum and dad to them. Um, I don't even remember Felice was going. I remember my mum saying to me, get back inside and go upstairs. So I had to end up going back inside and upstairs. I came to this country in 1978 and I was shocked because I thought that racism didn't exist because I came from Jamaica thinking everybody was everybody, everybody loved everybody. So I was shocked when people were calling me names and I thought, oh, why, why, why were you doing that? I don't understand why you were doing that. I faced racism uh, physically uh, as well because um, when I came to uh, in UK in 1978, I joined the Royal Air Force. And in the Royal Air Force, if you think racism is bad outside of the community, you want to join it at that time. I remember that when we reached at Streatham Station and we were walking up to the flat, this little boy, he shouted a racist slur to my dad. And I didn't hear exactly what he said, but my dad said, you racist, you know. He pushed his head through the window and he said something racist. And I was like, oh my God, like, you know, you know I'm black in a majority country that is white. One evening I was, um, I, I was on shift, I uh, worked till about 10 o'clock that night. And on the way home from work, I was walking on the path going, and it was, it was on the base this time, not, not outside in the, in, the, in the street, it was on the base. There were two guys, white uh, guys in front of me walking and I could hear them they were drinking like drinking beer in a bottle there. And I could hear one of them saying, oh, here comes that nigger. And the other one, it was a, it's a taller one saying, here comes that nigger. And the shorter one was saying, yeah, yeah, I've seen him. So as I walked past, he swung the beer bottle and hit me right across my face, knocked me out, you know, straight on the ground. And, and he followed up with other things, other blows as well. I, I remember st staggering away because uh, to where I was, there was a train line just beyond the uh, disused train line. I think it was disused at the time. And I, w I remember in my mind walking, trying to get away while he was whipping me with this bottle, you know. Uh, and um, I walked, and the other guy was saying, Leave him alone, leave him. You've you done him now, you've done him now. He said, Oh no, let's kill him. You know, let's kill him. And the other one said, No, 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 let, let him go, let him go. Let's, let's, come on, come on, come on. I could hear that. And then I never, and the only time, the only time I remember 
the only thing I remember later on was being in hospital, uh, looking up in the lights in the hospital. Um, that's, you know, if you almost, it seems like somebody saw me whilst I was, you know, rolling down the hill towards it, this huge train line. Somebody must have seen me and, uh, and reported and they, I don't know who took me back. I don't know where, I, how I managed to be recovered from where I was. No idea, I knew nothing about it. I don't know who was my, who was my um, saviour that time. Britain has become more ethnically diverse over the years. A census in 1991 showed that 50% of black Caribbean men born in the UK had white partners. The Sunday Times reported in 2000 that Britain had the highest rate of interracial relationship in the world. Mixed ethnicity had been the fastest growing ethnic group of the last two decades. This has become more evident in British society, especially in London. Those from ethnic minorities have become more integrated into British society. Some have taken on senior roles or responsibilities where diversity is fundamental to the success of the businesses. It seems that we have made great strides in Britain in terms of racial discrimination over the years. But what are things really looking like now? Two thousand and eighteen, the seventh of March, I went to report, and I just see this officer came out and called my name and take me around to a room. Say, yeah, they're gonna interview me, and they asked me for my passport details I tell them that they got it. I haven't seen my passport from 2003. So they said, how long you are here? I said, from 2001. So he says to me, um, you are here to be detained. And I said, what for? What have I done? He said, you are to be detained to go on the plane on the next day, fly. When I did come back into England, I got stopped. And they said to me that we're not going to let you back into the country. I've known people who have self-harmed. Um, I myself have considered suicide on, on occasions because this is my home. Well, Downing Street says it has just accepted the resignation of its Home Secretary. Amber Rudd was in the spotlight as the controversy deepened around how her office treated members of the so-called Windrush generation. The United Kingdom's Home Secretary has resigned from her post after an ongoing immigration scandal. Amber Rudd said she resigned for inadvertently misleading a committee during a questioning about the so-called Windrush scandal. generation meaning people who came from across the Commonwealth pre-73 which you know includes people from Jamaica and Windrush but also all the rest of the Caribbean Africa Asia and so on. About 2010 we already started to notice it very early on uh, around 2011 with uh, deportations uh, starting to increase and charter planes being ordered. This was happening to people here and there, you know, individuals, but there's a huge stigma attached to it. So people didn't necessarily come forward. Um, some people would have been deported 
and didn't go public on it because of that stigma and shame and you know trauma and just like confusion over what's actually happening, something that could happen quite fast. And we need to put an end to any more illegal deportation of British citizens. And I mean British citizens, people that have been here since they were children, people that have been here for over 60 years are now facing uh, the sack from their jobs. They're, they're facing no medical support. They're facing um, lack of benefits. They're losing their properties. They're having to beg, steal and borrow to find money to uh, get lawyers in order to be able to stay in this country. We have a situation where um, people who came pre-73 often divided at the time their family across borders because they couldn't afford to bring everyone at once. They've answered a call which is a call to rebuild Britain. They have been invited, encouraged, recruited to come to, to rebuild the wealth of Britain. There was direct recruitments that were done by um, the Employment Office, Department of Employment in the UK, by um, large public sector employers that went, you know, even mill owners, that went to the Caribbean and other countries and did direct recruitment. And they've sacrificed to do it and they've hoped for a better future as a result of it. People thought they were coming, they were, they, they, you know, they were part of the British Empire, that generation, as far as they were concerned. They were, they were quite proud of the links to Britain, even though all of that is a legacy of colonialism and enslavement, effectively racism in itself. We're already hearing the horror stories of people being denied uh, health care, uh, 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 hospital treatment as a consequence of their status, presumed status. We're already hearing about people losing their homes, their livelihoods and, and their marriages breaking up. People came, they've worked all their lives, they've bought their houses, they've raised their families, they've raised children and grandchildren and then suddenly find out, okay, well you're here illegally, you can't stay, you're going to be deported or effectively exiled because imagine you only went away for a two-week holiday so you've got your job, you've got your home, you know, and you can't come back to the country. So people have found their homes repossessed or if it was social housing or, you know, privately rented. I mean, people just don't understand the level of disaster that these things visit upon a community. And it's not just that individual, it's the entire family who have to bear uh, uh, the uh, stress and cost uh, uh, for sometimes years and years of denial of wrong, wrongly denied and citizenship. They may have lost all their belongings if they didn't have a family member to go and salvage it before it was destroyed or given away. We've had people where their hair have fallen out, they've lost loads of weight, um, people have had cancer, the cancer has been exacerbated because of the stress that they suffered, families torn apart, lost perfectly good honest jobs, lost out in the pension entitlements. We've got countless examples of elderly people being deported to Jamaica, no money, nowhere to live, no family connections, who have been targeted in terms of criminality or just treated appallingly. It took some time for it to unfold and to be really exposed and it's something that you know we were campaigning on as I said a number of years ago. Due to the enforced uh, new hostile environment regime brought in by the 2004 Act. Migrants then were reported, were required to report weekly, monthly, depending on where they live, to a police station uh, to, sign, to sign documents to make sure that people knew where they are and so on and so forth. Well, what happened then, that, that gave the Home Office a steady stream of people that it could put on charter planes to send back home. They go for people who are low-hanging fruit, people who are complying with the system, that are signing in with the Home Office, that may be going through appeals or going through a process of naturalisation. Uh, and of course, what we found over the last uh, year, 18 months, is that five of the individuals who were uh, sent back home, particularly to Jamaica, were murdered in Jamaica. Uh, because they left Jamaica, because they'd given evidence against people who committed crimes and, and so on over there. So when they were returned on some minor technicality, they themselves were subject to grievous uh, murder. I mean, up to this day, you know, some of the people that I've been supporting and trying to help with their campaigns, you know, for, for Right to Remain, 
will put out on Twitter, for example, I'm going to sign in today with the Home Office. If you don't hear from me in the next few hours, be worried and please do something about it because, you know, your phone can be taken away and so on. Then they, they will give you a different phone. But in that transition period of transporting you, detaining you, to transporting you to detention centre, you may not even have the means to contact people. We've seen people, uh, uh, a young boy who was homeless in the middle of, in, in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, born all his life here, didn't, didn't have uh, a clue what he was supposed to do and was teased and, and, and bullied mercilessly by the local Jamaican kids as it is. He's a, a foreign child, he doesn't speak any Jamaican, everybody thinks he's an idiot uh, and he was bullied mercilessly. My uncle was directly no, no, affected as are lots of people's family members. I mean, the more you go to meetings, whether you're in the social movement, whether it's in unions or campaign groups, you find people that know people in their family are directly affected. It's becoming much more wide scale. I've had to visit an 86 year old uh, uh, at the request of a daughter because she's Caribbean uh, from Trinidad and Tobago and she was ill but she wouldn't go to the hospital because they, she thought they were going to deport her and this was this year uh, and I had to go and convince her that actually I'd come with you there's no threat of you getting deported and so on and so forth but this is the effect that it's having on people people are saying I'm not going to send my kid to school because I think they're going to uh, uh, try and comfort me in some way or I'm not going to seek medical help because I don't know whether they're, they're going to uh, uh, deport me. I don't class myself as an illegal immigrant. Illegal immigrant to me is when someone crosses the border without any knowledge of the Home Office. Immigration accept me through the airport with a landing ticket, paid for, insured. What the scandal did was it helped to, to bring people's voices up to say, actually, yes, it's happening in my family, my aunt or my cousin or my, you know, uncle, my dad, my brother, my mum. So. If you take my passport from 2003 and the rules that I try to renew in my, my, my extension under, it was under the five years rule. In 2016, around 15, 16, he then was asked, because of his GP changing a catchment area, to provide evidence of his status in the UK because he wasn't because obviously when he gets a form it's not born in this country and now after 1914 it's now starts asking more questions if you're not born in this country to ask answer more questions and provide more information so he was asked to provide information he's thinking I don't have a passport I've never traveled not only has he never traveled he never had an independent passport because his Jamaican passport wasn't really his it was his my mum's that's expired long time ago. No one has a passport for him. So his life then just unraveled. Um, he lost access to his benefits. He was on ESA and disability living allowance for his illnesses. He lost all those. He started losing his help with his rent. He went into rent arrears and then eventually had to reach out to his family. He had a complete distress state. People are very proud of that generation, very proud to, that they are sorted, they've sorted themselves out, they're in control of their lives and all of a sudden they're in control of nothing. Going to my MP, I had to then thought, you know what, I've got enough paperwork, I've HMRC, I've got Department of Work, I've got all the paper, a large part of it, I'm going to go and see um, my MP. So I went to a surgery. Um, and I saw a, a representative and I sort of like gave him, I said, look, this is what my story is. Oh my God, how come? Okay, we're going to take it to the main MP. <laughs> I took it, I waited, and then I got a letter back saying, you need to just go and naturalise. And I was like, but this is what I'm saying, I can't work, I can't get benefits, I'm basically selling second-hand stuff within my house for me to live because that's the only way I was able for me to live. But then when my MP turned around and I got that letter, I was like, well, there's no hope. So straight away, I went straight into depression. 
I, I didn't know what to do. I just felt lost. I, I felt there's no one else for me to turn to because I can't fight a government. I haven't got money to fight them. I can't pay a solicitor because I haven't got money to pay a solicitor. So whatever happens, happens to me. There's nothing more. But my concern was more mostly for my, my son again. Um, I got to the stage where he's getting depressed and I'm more depressed and I, I, I went to bed. I couldn't sleep because I, I, you know, you don't, you're, you're uneasy. And I woke up one morning and I just said, I think if I just take some tablets and sort of like close my eyes, perhaps this will all go away. Perhaps it will just all disappear. If in 2003 I put my application in and then 2008 my passport would be expired, why you keep my passport until it expired and then you said I am illegal and, I'm, and I am an illegal immigrant? The Immigration Act of 1971 stated that Commonwealth citizens lost their automatic right to remain in the UK, meaning they faced the same restrictions as those from elsewhere. They would, in the future, only be allowed to remain in the UK after they lived and worked here for five years. 1971 Immigration Act, I said, was set up to really, when Britain was changing um, its stance and its place in Europe, it was set up to protect the Commonwealth citizens. And people were um, told point blank, if you come here before the 1st of Jan 1973, you have the right of abode, meaning that you can remain as long as you wish. There's no employment restrictions, there's no, nothing, you know, and you can come and go as you wish. That was set in stone. Um, and then if someone came here to join their partner before 1988 or their children came across um, from the Caribbean or Africa or, or Asia, parts of Southern Asia for that matter, uh, to join their parents and they were under 18, they were entitled to right of abode, meaning they've got a minimum of the right to live in the UK. And that's a right and that's actual, that's in legislation. When I was in England, I can't remember what year it was, but there was a year when they said amnesty or whatever. All Jamaican citizens, all Jamaican people, whether they had a British passport or what com was called a Commonwealth passport at the time, you're not British anymore and you've got to get your nationality. What they did was they took away, they just hollowed out the meaning of British subject. And so they started redefining Britishness. And um, that meant, with the 71 Act on top, um, as they, they took away the rights across the Commonwealth, they brought in a new um, mechanism, which is this patriality rule, um, that meant that if you had a parent or grandparent who was both British but also born in Britain, then you could come, you can settle, you can get residency, you can end up, you know, you have a pathway. For example, people who um, immigrate from Australia, they have a right to stay in the UK, don't they, if they can prove they've got a grandparent yeah, that's British, and most of those people will, because they have those links. If you're from the Caribbean or from Nigeria or from Pakistan, you're not going to have um, you know, many generations going back. That was for the Canadians, that was for the Australians, that was for the white settlers of, in Zimbabwe. That was because you know those, communi those people who'd ancestors have gone and settled, even if they've never set foot back in Britain at all, can always be a accessing, um, be in accessing Britain, the UK, um, whilst taking that away for, uh, on, on black people, Asian people, and so on. Um, it's thoroughly racist. It was explicitly racist. The, the cabinet discussions at the time were all, we have to stop these East African Asians. We have to control these numbers. That the problem for race relations in Britain is a problem of the number of 
non-white people in Britain, that the existence of any problem of race relations belongs to having too many black or Asian people. Like, you have a few, but control the numbers, you know, which means selling to white people the idea that your security is based in your skin colour, your belonging is based on your skin colour. So it is invoking racism, it's, it's dividing the society along racial lines. 25th of October 1968, the Race Relations Bill came into law as the Race Relations Act 1968. This act expanded the provision of the 1965 Race Relations Act, which banned racial discrimination in public places and made promoting racial hatred a crime. The 1968 Act focused on eradicating discrimination in housing and employment. This act made sure that the second generation immigrants who were born here will get the jobs for which they are qualified and the houses they can afford. And so what you had in 68 was both bringing in of a race relations act on the one hand, which um, was saying, you know, racism within the country is bad, you know, it's now outlawed, you can't turn someone away from a business or something because of the colour of their skin, you know, all those signs that used to say no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, they have to come down. But then at the same time, they put a colour bar up on the country that if you're coming to Britain, if you're white, you're welcome. If you're black, you're not. Theresa May declared in an interview with The Telegraph in May 2012 that she wanted to create a really hostile environment for irregular migrants in the UK. The key moment in the development of the modern hostile environment was the creation of what was initially called the Hostile Environment Working Group in 2012. This involved a wide range of ministers from across government, including care services, employment, housing, schools, justice, healthcare and transport. The idea was to make life in the UK unsustainable for those who were unlawfully residents by cutting them off from the necessity of life and preventing them access to public services. We know then that since um, the EU referendum and the whole Brexit saga, whether there's been a, uh, a rise of the right wing, and I remember writing an article that was picked up in national press, are we now going back to the days of no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, which I do sincerely believe we are. The hostile environment came out because we live in a systemically racist society. Not institutionalised, because institutionalised means it's just confined to one institution. We live in a society which has systemic discrimination, which discrimination is now inbuilt into the system. And so when the, uh, uh, the elections in 2015 and so on were taking place, uh, the Tories decided to make a virtue out of trying to reduce immigration even further. There had been lots of scandals about English and second languages schools who were, who were having fake students registered, uh, that uh, people were taking advantage and, you know, uh, uh, jumping housing queues and uh, they were taking... And then it, it came the popular refrain that migrants were unfairly undercutting British workers in terms of being prepared to work for less wages than their British counterparts, so British citizens were, were losing jobs. And I even hear uh, black people and Africans make that argument, that actually Eastern Europeans should go to taking our jobs. Uh, spectacular uh, uh, bout of amnesia or temporal insanity uh, for those individuals, but nevertheless that was their view. And we saw the vans, did we not, driving around saying, if you're illegal, we're coming to get you, you know, report to the hotline, uh, the Home Office hotline. We had countless speeches by the Home Secretary, who was then Theresa May, later went on to be Prime Minister, talking about tough on migrants, 
we're going to deport tens of thousands of people uh, and we're uh, calling on uh, the wider British society, doctors and nurses, not to provide treatment for people who can't provide their citizenship, not to provide schooling for, for, for families who can't prove that they're in their legal entitlement. Landlords are not to rent houses to people uh, uh, so, or they'll be subject to huge fines from the Home Office if they're found to be illegal citizens. It became a completely antagonistic, punitive, enforcement-led culture, which was all about creating that fundamental culture of doubt about anything that anybody with a black face would say to an immigration official. It was, um, it was even where people had complete objective evidence of their stay in this country, they were still deported, they were still disbelieved. So a position which I always wanted that job because the, the GP practice was so close to me and I was saying, oh, I really want that job. And when I saw it come up, I thought, right, I'm going to apply for it. But I applied as a receptionist and I said, right, it's 20 hours a week. That's brilliant. That's a great job. Um, the lady who interviewed me, she overlooked me. She said, you're too experienced for that. We need a, a practice administrator. And I'm like, well, I didn't want to do reception work. I didn't want to do 20. She went, no, no, it's going to be the same hours, but we need someone who overlooked the receptionist and I was like okay all right yeah I'll do that job but she was just there as an interim um, manager until they could find a full-time manager so she gave me the position she was quite happy you know I said to her this is my I've got I had my um, Dominican passport at the time because that's the only ID I had um, and I gave her that she obviously looked over my record she got references brought for me and I managed to get the job. I was so happy. 20 hours a week and in walking distance of my home. Oh, what else could you ask for? <laughs> and the money was good. The money was good for the 20 hours. Uh, she extended the uh, uh, housing provisions so that landlords then had to check their citizenship status of their tenants, which meant that landlords just started to charge a premium. Just started to say, well, I can let you move in my house, but because I have to check all your citizenship papers, I require an additional deposit. Or, you know, I'm not going to tell the Home Office if you pay me an additional £100 a week for your rent. So it acted as a, as a means of leverage in which landlords were exploiting poor people even further. And then you had the notions, didn't you, of teachers and, and, and hospital staff who began reporting who they thought were uh, uh, illegal citizens. Uh, and uh, it didn't bear scrutiny. Uh, you know, I would say the vast majority of those people reported by the government's hotline, ring this number if you think somebody's illegal, were, you know, fake, bogus, uh, and other entirely erroneous accusations, uh, uh, the majority of which were made at people who had every right to be in the country. So I was in a position, I, quite, I enjoyed it, I was enjoying it um, a lot. It, it was responsibilities, but I don't mind that because I'm a multitasker anyway. Um, then we got a new manager, a full-time one, and um, he was very adamant. Um, well, I can't see any of your paper. I was like, well, I got, I'm in the job already. No, we need, you need to have a British passport. I said, why do you keep going on about this? And all you have to do is pick up the phone and, you know, call up any of the other people that I've worked for and they'll tell you who I am. I've got over like, you know, 20 odd years service with NHS. No. No, nope, we need the British passport. It was like this every day. Then he would find fault with whatever work I was doing. I'm, like, but I'm, I'm a professional, I know what I'm doing. This isn't my first time in administration. Until it got to the point where he, I was getting annoyed with him because it was like every week he would be talking about the same thing, about me not having a, a British passport, me not being able to work here, we're gonna get fined 10,000 pounds. So I said, okay, you call the Home Office in front of me and you hear what they're going to say. I'm quite happy. If they want to come and turf me out the job, they can. I'm quite happy for you to do that. He called them up and they said, um, "We is she in the position? I was sitting in the room and he was like, yes, she is. Well, she's in the position. That's okay. Nope, he didn't. He wouldn't have it. So I said, well, the system that's in now is that my employees can apply for the permit for me to stay in the position if you believe it's actually... Nope, he didn't want that. It was like this back and forth until he actually gave me a letter. I was crying every day. I would come home. I'd be crying. This man's driving me mad. I can't even get to work. He's telling me the same thing. I'm quite happy. Uh, my children were getting upset because I was upset. And 
I was going through trauma. I'd go to the doctor and say, you know, I'm, I'm so stressed out. I don't even know if I can go into work. Um, in the end, he ended up giving me a letter telling me that <laughs> that they have to terminate my employment because I haven't got a British passport and it's breach of my contract and I haven't got the right for me to work here. And so it propagated that act, the 2004 act, a whole culture of codified racism into law. It didn't say in the legislation, stop black people, but the, the culture, the working culture at the Home Office said that black people are the least believed people in the entire world. You can deport them, most people will believe that they're here illegally or guilty of something. Uh, and so we can deport them without huge backlash in the community and that's exactly what they started to do. From the standpoint of the government, these policies aren't accidental. The Windrush scandal was inevitable. Some scandals are inevitable because this is a system they've created and it's full of crises and it is far-reaching, it is opportunistic. Um, it's driven by the statistics of trying to get people onto lists to deport to show that we're being tough on immigrants. And, and that means, no, um, of course, all sorts of people uh, are gonna get caught up in that. Um, but, and the government knew that. I mean, there's no way that the politicians couldn't know that beforehand. Unless they wanna argue some incompetence, you bring in policies without modeling them what is their effect on people? Well, that's ridiculous. Of, of course, they know the damage that they're doing. And so when you see this hostile environment, as it was described, actually what it was, it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was an informal type of apartheid culture that was targeting black people, Caribbeans, Africans, anybody who would not be readily believed by either the press or the wider public. Uh, and that's how racism works, with the sort of quiet conspiratorial consent of people's prejudices. Something like that, being a, a single mother of four children, um, you can't give up for your children. But when you're confronted with something like that, and it's the government that's against you as well, then you just want to give up. You do want to give up. And that's how I felt. I was looking around thinking, well, my kids are all big. Uh, maybe we just have to pull through as we can. But then I was under the impression, OK, I've, I've paid my national insurance contributions. You don't want to give me a job. OK, well, I'll just go and sign on until, you know, I can get something else. But you can't get something else because you're told you can't work in England. But then the biggest thing was going and trying to claim um, benefits and then being told no. Why? And then you know what the answer is going to be. Well, you ain't got a passport. And you say, okay, well, I've got to do what I have to do because as a mother, you have to survive. Um, and I ended up having to, instead of my, my children throwing away their old trainers, I'd clean it up. You'd see me there with my bleach, I'd be cleaning it up. And I'm taking pictures and I'm selling it on eBay because I have to have some money coming in somehow. I can't just sit back and rely on my children. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's hard when I think about it. But... But these are the things you have to go through. Um, yeah. So you can see how the combination of a hostile, denying you your income, you can't work. You know, we've got examples of a, a, a builder who was in the, in the newspaper in, in um, April of this year. 46, worked all his life, has his own business, designated as not being British. They kept his passport for over a year. He lost his business. He lost his income, he lost his home, and then he lost his wife as a consequence of all of that stress. And this is just one example of somebody who should have been afforded the right to stay here and allowed to get on with their lives and been subject to this catastrophe of state interference, code, state codified racism in any other form that's uh, so uh, uh, brutally targeted uh, black people in the, in the UK. On the 14th of May 2014, the Immigration Act 2014 was given royal assent. According to the Home Office, the Act was to ensure that British immigration system would be fairer to British citizens and legitimate migrants, while being tougher on those with no right to be here. Indeed, Home Secretary Theresa May at the time was explicit 
when the bill was introduced that its purpose was to create a hostile environment for migrants in the UK. Well, essentially, it was about uh, f uh, fast, uh, uh, fast tracking deportations. Theresa May had already gone into the election saying she was going to bring the numbers down of immigration down to the tens of thousands, which was an ambitious claim. She was never going to get there. But in order to try and facilitate that, they needed a piece of legislation that would allow them to bypass human rights legislation and remove people very quickly. And they were able to do that by removing legal aid to those who uh, had in-country appeals against uh, unfair Home Office decisions. And from that point on, you had a right to appeal, but you could only do it from the country you were deported to. So in effect, you didn't have a right to an appeal, essentially, uh, unless you had lots of money uh, and you could afford private lawyers or, uh, 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 to whichever country you were deported to. When we, when we found out about this particular flight, we only really found out you know, about a week before. So in that time, we started, you know, trying to lobby airlines, the airports, raising awareness, you know, doing a Twitter storm around what was happening um, and doing a call out for people to actually get some advice if they think they could be, they could fall into this category. Um, you know, trying to reach out to people who were being detained um, or threatened with um, deportation. I asked him if I can call my solicitor. They said, you have to call your solicitor when you reached at the detention center at Yarzwood. So they took me there. They waited until about, I think it was about eight, eight o'clock in the night before they took me from Beckett House to Yarlswood. We reached there about, about, about 12 or a little bit after 12. We get calls from people who are destitute or got nowhere to sleep or nothing to eat. Um, there's a stigma attached to them. So what we've seen even this year um, you know, the likes of the Jamaican Gleaner newspaper, who I wrote to the particular journalist on one occasion and complained, having screaming headlines of convict plane arriving in Jamaica. And that was at the same time that the Home Secretary announced in Parliament the week of that deportation that this, is, um, a, this isn't Windrush generation people, these are people that are very serious criminals, they're rapists and murderers. And the vast majority of those people didn't fall into those categories. And they included, for example, somebody who had done a serious driving offence, um, was a young person. So we're talking about amongst those people deported, there were 22, 23 and 24 year olds that were targeted. Inside the Arleswood, it's like a hell. It shouldn't be for human, even with the food that you get there to eat. You have somebody that's ushering you that you're handcuffed to, so you don't have your own phone, so we had to speak to him through that person. Um, and he said, well, you know, well, we said, but he's not supposed to be taken. He said, well, until I have authority and anybody tells me anything different, I have to take him. You know, there are several people. He actually said this to me on the phone. There are several people who are saying the same thing tonight, that they shouldn't be taken. I was vomiting and blood was coming up. So while I was vomiting and they were knocking on the door and I told them um, I'm ill I'm, 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 I'm ill I'm vomiting you need to get the health care or someone to come and have a look so when the officer came they have to take me down to the health care. They get a wheelchair and take me down to the health care. And then she says to me that she won't let they take me 
are in that state. One person that um, I've been campaigning for had got an injunction, his legal team had got him an injunction the day before to take him off that flight and in the middle of the night he was snatched. And the way it's done is really horrendous. So he was still in detention. So of course he went to bed, even though he knew that a flight was going, thinking he was okay. His family were actually, his partner with the children, were going to drive down the night before, thinking they're gonna to have to say their final goodbyes. And when um, the injunction came through, they said, okay, there's no, there's no need for us to rush there midweek with small children driving 200 miles. We can wait for the weekend and go and see him now. There's no urgency. So they didn't go. And around 1 a.m., I got a call from his partner saying they've taken him. And I actually said, taken him where? I mean, it's obvious when she said they've taken him, why? But it's just like, I couldn't believe this is happening. I had to process it in my own mind. Is this really happening? I didn't know that bacteria was on my stomach. The food that you eat inside here, and not just my stomach, there are lots of people who have a problem. You know? We had to wake up the legal team in the middle of the night. They had to do another injunction in the middle of the night. And, we've, and when they queried with the courts, why have you done this? The response that came back was that uh, a fax came through undoing the injunction from the day before, which was an application that was done way before then. So they've decided that will answer that one from two or three or four weeks ago, but they'll do it at 2 a.m. in the morning when you're querying why they've done this. So they cancelled out, they undone the one from the night, the afternoon before. They had to do another one in the middle of the night. That took through the whole process of the night so that by the time the individual was told that he would be allowed to stay in the UK, even though he was put back in detention, he was already on the plane and he was the final person they put on the flight aboarded because they knew, because we'd alerted them to the fact that there was something you know, really wrong. So they did, even held off, put him on the flight to the last minute. By that time, he's chained from the waist down and you're cuffed and attached to two guards on either side. And that's how you're taken. Imagine it's uncomfortable anyway, isn't it? On a long flight, a long haul flight or even a short haul flight. Imagine having to sit like that. So when you want to go to the toilet, you're chained to these two people. And so he was already in that position, ready for takeoff. And then he got a tap on the shoulder saying, oh, we're taking you off now. By that, he, by that time, he's been taken in the middle of the night in a minivan all the way from London to Birmingham, only to be taken all the way back. I didn't get any medication because the medication that I take in with me, they had it, and they didn't give it to me. They didn't give, give the medication to me because they said they have to check on what I'm getting first. So they gave me Panadol, Paracetamol, Paracetamol. There was um, uh, an elderly woman whose children, grandchildren had grown up in the UK. She was, her, her husband was British and she was in the final stages of being naturalised when um, her husband died, uh, sadly, and she was told, well, your husband's dead now, so you don't need to stay in the UK. It's since I came out and I went to do a blood test which in as in the Alzwood, they took blood tests from me, five bottles of blood, and until now, I don't see neither the bottle, I don't hear any result of the blood test, nothing at all. But I went to do a blood test, and they called me in that, um, I develop a bacteria on my stomach that need to be treated. So when I went in and they, they gave me um, antibiotics, so I have to be on some antibiotics. And then after the antibiotics, then they write me to say, I am going to be 
and um, Lanza Prasol. Lanza Prasol, I think the name of it, for a long term because of what I develop on my stuff. One man went to sign in, his regular fortnightly signing in, and obviously when you are in that immigration status, you can't work. So he was the primary carer of his young infant and his partner went to work. So he had the baby, you know, in the push chair. They took the baby away and gave the baby to social services and didn't even afford him a phone call to call the partner, the mum or any other family member to say, can you come and get the baby? So that means they had social services standing by ready because it, otherwise it would have been quicker to just let him phone a family member to come and get the baby. So many things happened since 2003. It is unfair for me if I did say, well, then commit a crime or was in anything wrong and then that is my punishment, then I would say, well, then, you know, I made a wrong choice by being on the wrong side of the law, but I've never, and I'm not intent to, even though they are doing me all this displeasure, they are the only people that done me displeasure, and that's the home office. I've never had any problem with anyone else. I've got so many friends here. I've got my family here, my children, my grandchildren, my friends, and I am so accustomed now to the culture that for me now at my age to go farm friends again because in Jamaica most of the people in my group who died out, some migrate to other foreign countries. You know, so you didn't even leave me with a choice to say, well then, if I go home, I can have a choice to say, well then, go to America or go to Canada or go to the Bahamas or anywhere. Because I am a deportee. No other country is going to accept you when you are a deportee. When you are a deportee, that means you commit some crime why they have to deport you. So why you falsely want to class me as a deportee and an illegal immigrant after you took my passport for so many years. I've never feel so low and so empty as how I feel, but because of the love of the family and the friends that I have around me and a partner who care for me. And there are people who have been born in Britain and there are cases like current cases going on at the moment who have been told that they are not British citizens. They're born in Britain. So I know of a number of different scenarios, different cases. So there's one where they were born in Britain, they grew up in Britain for part of their childhood, and then they, one of their parents went back to the Caribbean and they grew up, grew up for the rest of the time there. They're told they're not British. At that time that the presenting officer for the Home Office, when I told them that I keep asking for my passport, from since 2003, and he just said, we got it. So they had this passport all along? All along. And they make you go through yes. all those years, yes. knowing that they had your passport yes. all along? Yes. <laughs> 
Are they giving you your passport back? I haven't seen my passport until now. There is um, a woman in Preston who um, her one parent is British and one parent is from the Caribbean. And I forget which Caribbean country now, but from a Caribbean country. And because her mother put on the birth certificate only her own name, because there wasn't necessarily, you know, a requirement, you have the short birth certificate in those days and a long one. Because I remember that when I wanted copies of my birth certificates, I had to pay more money to get the long certificate that has more details than my dad's details on it. The short one just has my mum on it. So you're not told there's consequences if you don't put down the father, yeah? So only her mother was registered literally simply because the dad wasn't available on the day to go there. So for that, for that reason, because it turned out transpired her mum's immigration status was an issue because of the Windrush scandal and hostile environment, they said she's not a British citizen. She never left the UK. She'd grown up in the UK her whole life. She was born in the UK, lived her entire life in the UK, and she's told that she's here illegally as well. So to me, it's like you, you, you're, you're trading on people's life. You're trading on people's livelihood. You are robbing people of their livelihood, of their integrity, their dignity. When we're talking about, you know, righting a wrong, in a sense, um, we're specifically talking about the injury that has been done to myself and my sisters. My mother has passed, you know, my daddy has gone. So you can't compensate me for losing my daddy under those circumstances. But my sisters have been traumatised. We have all been traumatised. But specifically my, si my two sisters have been traumatised and they've never recovered you know, from what, what has happened. But even, even for those who are accepted now, even for those who haven't, who they haven't tried to renege over the last few years, who may be there in a retirement home now, still have family that they may never see again. Because even though they're British, they weren't born in Britain. So their children, their grandchildren don't have a right to come. The very children that they left behind to be looked after by grandparents so that they could come and work here, they don't have the right to come. And they're being put in detention centers. Those who came, maybe on a visitor visa, or maybe, um, maybe as you were saying, at a time where you could come, like you could visit, but you had to keep renewing, you had to keep extending. Uh, you could come, but you don't belong. Around the same time, around the Windows scandal around May, I think, 2018, they refused that application, and I was told that I have to go home. There was a long list of why I can't stay here. I have not committed no crime. I have done everything to the law. They said that my dad is not enough family ties and I should go home. They gave me a right of appeal. We then went to the appeal, then the court ruled again that I do not have enough family ties. So the, the answer is, these immigration policies, they are written and, and, and scribed in a way to squeeze people out. And then you have to ask the question, it's very racist because it seems to target Africans and Afro-Caribbeans the most. And right now I'm in a predicament because we have just appealed to go to court and the court said no. So now we have to take it further to go to the upper tribunal and we don't know the outcome. And I have spent around £10,000 between last year and this year on immigration, including visas, solicitor's fee and barrister's fee. So this is where I am. Those are the, their whole family, their younger siblings, grandchildren, all may be British. But they're still subjected to immigration controls, they're being put in detention centres and that's where we've been meeting number of people, a number of cases which we're now challenging. Um, we're looking to bring together a lot of these uh, extended uh, Windrush cases, people who came as adults after 1973 but were connected to that 
Windrush generation. They have a right to be here. And um, it is only the continued racism of those laws that were brought in in the 60s and 70s that denies them the right, the same right that a white person would have. Because of my dad's illness and stuff, he wasn't in that faculty to fight for things as he was meant to. So it left it stagnated. And when you're 15, 14, 14, 13, what do you know about fighting case? You know, by right, your parents are responsible for you. You understand? So that is what I've been arguing. What about the compassion there? I mean, if, if, if I could, as a child, and knew what was going on to, the ex to, to, to an extent, then I probably would have been like, OK, can I get help? But I was a kid. And what the Home Office is saying that they're not looking at that. They're not looking at that. They, they're looking at it now. Now. So every time you're sending a case, they look at your immediate circumstances. They're really, they're not really taking what happened in the past. So the caseworker is not going and said, oh, well, let me weigh up the situation. You know, this, 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 this flawed immigration history wasn't started by Shankia. It was started by those responsible for Shankia. Now, a immigration lawyer who's good would say, well, that is discretionary relief to remain. That's where human rights need to come in because she didn't make that mistake. But within that clause, there are certain things. Do I, do I got a child? Do I got a partner? If you don't have that, then at times you don't have any weight. The trauma that family members are going through, so not only are grandchildren and children being impacted as well and told you're here illegally, you don't have the right status, even where they do, yeah, um, they are dealing with the consequences of that. So it's having you know, psychological, social, economic impacts on them, and that's going to have a knock-on impact on future generations. Because also for children, the trauma of that might mean that they don't do well in their education because they're stressed and worried. Um, that will have consequences for jobs and edu further education, higher education. So there are, you know, the impacts of the Windrush uh, scandal could be going on for generations to come, even if they fix the actual immediate issues, which they haven't yet, even though they say they've apologised and they've sorted it out. We know these things are going on still all the time. The government responded by launching the Windrush compensation scheme in April 2019 to ensure that affected members of the Windrush generation receive payments for the impact on their lives. This includes payment for loss of employment benefits and other forms of hardship. We are absolutely committed to making sure that those who wrong receive proper compensation. That is why I appointed in, uh, independent persons, uh, Martin Ford QC, who, who has done uh, an enormous amount of good work on this. He asked for an extension of the compensation scheme so he could speak to even more people that were affected, and I brought that to the House, and I accepted that extension, and now we are working through the work that he and his team have done to come forward with a well-thought-through compensation scheme that is generous and supports members of that generation and in the meantime we have put in place a vulnerable person scheme that I referred to earlier and an exceptional uh, payment scheme which has started making payments. Well they would tell us that I'm sure they would tell us they're doing lots of things. Um, at the moment they seem to be um, spending most of their time looking at the pending compensation scheme which did go out for consultation which is just closed. Um, we did contribute to that. Um, we um, had representation at the uh, event that was held within Nottingham where the relevant people that are working on that particular um, part of the programme came into Nottingham and um, so we were part of that. So they have pledged to come back to Nottingham once there's a bit more detail as to what the scheme's going to look like so hopefully that will happen. The government has now done, uh, did also, in response to the Winrush scandal was to set up the Winrush compensation scheme. So first of all, uh, let me say that, you know, no amount of money can compensate for the wrongs that have been done to people. We've had situations, we now know that unfortunately we've had people who have been wrongly deported and have subsequently died. And you can't compensate for something like that. According to them, you know, they, they've, they've reached out to anybody that's impacted, so they've reversed any impact or, you know, immediate impact. But the reality is, if you've already been 
um, detained, if you've lost your job, you've lost your house, you've got all those consequences. Um, if you had you know, an employment gap or it's, it put you into poverty, um, it's made you ill. You might have you know, stress-related illness from, the, from all of it. There are people that also have not returned to the UK and it may be too difficult. They may want to, um, but they have to start again because they've lost everything. They may have been away so long that that's another difficulty to even, they might be elderly, so even travelling and, and so on and starting again is a difficult thing to do. The compensation scheme is now in place. Um, uh, the eligibility is, is, is limited and it's something that we recognise, but I, I do want to say that with regards to people engaging with it, we're really making a big push now to have surgeries whereby people can understand they can claim compensation for the injury or loss that they've suffered as a result of trying to prove their immigration status when they were legal um, citizens. When you examine the complexity of the compensation screen, um, it's as I say, you need to be an insurance loss adjuster with uh, several years experience, probably teaching the subject at a business school, to have any uh, chance of being to correlate your losses. How do you compensate for loss not being at your father's funeral? How do you compensate for being denied legal aid because of a criminal charge that you're facing, but you've been deemed here uh, as not a citizen, and therefore there's no legal aid for you, and you've gone to court and been found guilty because you're unable to defend yourself. How do you compensate for that? How do you compensate for families who have been told uh, you can, you can, your family's not being split up, your father can Skype you from Jamaica uh, and parent you over Skype? You know, these are the incalculable losses uh, that they're expecting ordinary people to go to a Citizens and Advice Bureau and fill in this 44-page form. The compensation scheme is getting on my last nerves because they ask you for every piece of paper and I've got every piece of paper and I've submitted every piece of paper to you. What is not clear for you to see, it's there. In, if you need information, pick up the phone and phone up. I mean, if I need something and I need to find out something, which I had to do to get to where I am now, um, they can do the same thing. So I don't understand what, what, what is the long process? What's taking them so long? I'm getting calls from people who are like, what's happening? I don't know. Have you submitted your form yet? Have you sent off the paperwork yet? What's the hold up? And it's getting, it's, it's getting me depressed because I'm not finding any way out of it. The Home Secretary has spoken about being a second generation migrant himself. On taking this job, he promised to do whatever it takes to put this wrong right. We are now 10 months on from when this scandal broke. Not a penny has been paid out to any Windrush victim in a compensation scheme. The independent Windrush Lessons Review has not yet reported. I'd say that's a compensation scheme with malicious intent. And its malicious intent is to funnel down and reduce dramatically the amount of people who claim compensation. And it's funny because although that compensation scheme has now been running for about a year, nobody's claimed the compensation because nobody can penetrate the kind of bureaucracy that's put in front of them. So much so that the Home Secretary two, three weeks ago had to make another announcement urging people to, to, to fill in the forms because they wanted to compensate people. But what he doesn't understand is that the culture of fear and intimidation that is put about is, 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 is making people less inclined to put themselves back in uh, a, a, a formal uh, a process uh, with this government because it's not trusted. It's really important that people understand that they can access it through the Home Office Task Force. We've been locally putting on some surgeries to help people understand how they can make a claim. So we're working with a, a local legal team and we're putting on these surgeries so that people can uh, understand the level of information that's required. Because they know at the end of the day, you, you have to give me, I lost 10 years of a pension, which I was paying into. Um, I, lost, I lost my job. I lost my job, which I loved and which was in walking distance. Do you know what it's like not having to pay travel fare to get to a job? Oh, heaven. And you can bring your lunch with you. Oh, 
So I lost that as well. And then I nearly lost my home. Yeah, I nearly lost my home through just the loss of finance. We see that virtually no compensation has been, been awarded 12 months on. We see people not taking up the offer of, uh, 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 of, of uh, filling in uh, the forms. And we see people still languishing in other countries uh, where they've been deported to, still not having been brought back. Uh, and people are still suffering the consequences of their de uh, rightful deni wrongful denial of citizenship. So the compensation scheme is designed to frustrate, it's designed to deter, it's designed to reduce the number of claimants, and it's designed to make sure that the smallest amount of money possible for government to get away with paying uh, will be delivered. Uh, and that will be delivered on the basis that you filled in the form wrong. <laughs> and the form is so complex, uh, I defy anybody to get it right. Which is why, after all this time, what there's been no compensation paid. Why is that? So I think we're very clear what this government is all about. They're disingenuous in their claims to want to put this right. They are malicious in their intent in terms of providing compensation for individuals. And they, put in, for, they put in place a process uh, that delivers on all of those outcomes for the government. They have to pay for this because what they've done They've affected people's lives in, in such a bad way that, and they don't understand it because they, they haven't been through it. And if they knew, if they only knew the calls that I get, I'm getting calls from people 60 odd who've lost their homes, having to sleep on sofas, don't know what they're going to do. I'm not an uh, immigration advisor. I can only be sympathetic because I understand what they're going through. I'm fortunate enough to have a family who's got support and still got the roof over my head and in good health. But these people, some of them are not in good health and it's not fair on them because they didn't do anything. It's a mistake made by the government. The government needs to own up. It's their mistake. Just don't walk away from it because every death that is happening to a Windrush person, they should feel guilty because it's because of them then people should be retiring right now and sitting down and enjoying even their pensions or what they're contributing and they're not able to because some of them are still living. Right now, it, you know, not being able, able to pay off some of my bills, it gets me upset and I don't want to fall back into depression. I don't want to. From my perspective, it tells you of the society in which we live and if, it is, if you're black, it's an uphill task for equality and also justice, without a shadow of a doubt and the playing field is not level. I mean, indeed, we've had some commentators actually say that Britain is now a post-racial nation. Well, I'll tell you what, they must be living in a totally different Britain to me, and I was born here. So we've always wore our passport on our faces, uh, and we've always been subject to some level of dis uh, racial profiling in immigration policy, and now immigration policy is inextricably linked to race in this country. When they're talking about reducing immigrants, they're actually talking about fewer black and brown people in the country. For the government to understand you cannot do this to us. Our parents are asked to come over here to help the motherland and they ask their children as well. My mum's thing was get a government job. That's all she ever said, get a government job, and which I did. And the government turned around and spat on me. My appeal to people is make sure you fight for your rights and get them now to ensure your children are not subject to what the Windrush children are now being subject to. And I guarantee you that their parents never thought that day would come for them, those kids. And those kids are currently being denied access to British citizenship unfairly and are threatened with deportation. We know in Britain there have been many battles against racism historically. And we're not prepared to go backwards. So so long as we can speak the plain truth about racism, we will always find people in Britain who will stand up and fight for the progress that has been won before, to maintain it and to build on it, to go further.
Martin Luther King once had a dream. We too have a dream for our nation. That people will not be judged by the color of their skin. The country they're from. But by the unique characters. We live together. We play together. We study together. We work together. We laugh together. We celebrate together. We dance together. But are we moving forward? Mm -hmm.